author of life. Man has turned violent, crushing lives, upending dreams, attacking the heart of a democratic nation with vitriol and hatred and coordinated acts of calculated terror. Source and creator, grant a perfect rest under your tabernacle of peace to the victims of terror in Paris, innocents murdered and wounded, men and women whose lives were cut off by witless aggression. Remember the survivors of this horror, grant them shelter and solace, comfort and consolation, blessing and renewal. Grant them endurance to survive, strength to rebuild, faith to mourn, courage to heal, and devotion to each other. Heavenly guide, hand of love and shelter, grant the people of Paris your protection, your wholeness and healing, and your peace. This beautiful prayer written by the liturgist Aidan Salavi draws our hearts back to last Shabbat, when instead of peace and harmony, so many found pain, suffering, or even death. And soon we heard many types of responses to this tragedy, some mournful, immersed in sorrow for a lost loved one, some relieved, those invited to the concert or had just left the restaurant, some triumphant at their group's success, unfortunately, some forsaking hope, and others trying to move beyond the moment to make a different point. I had a friend innocently ask me, Rabbi, I posted something on Facebook saying, don't just pray for Paris, also pay for Beirut, referencing the terror attack that had happened just the day before in this former French colony, killing around 40. Why did people react so negatively to my post? I explained it is about our own connection. We mourn based on our, on our relationships, and many of us have a deep connection with Paris, which doesn't mean that it is wrong to pray for Beirut as well, but simply that I don't have a personal connection with Beirut in the same way. Think of it as this way. If my great aunt passes away, God forbid, you're saying don't forget to mourn for other people that have suffered losses as well isn't what I'm looking to hear. Or in the language of our parasha, when I'm trying to express my relationship to one sister, don't slip another sister under the wedding veil. Another way I saw this hiding the wrong bride under the veil was in some pro-Israel Hasbara. Like the post, New York 9-11, Paris 11-13, Israel 24-7. Yes, it's true, but at the moment of mourning, it is unhelpful. Yes, your great aunt passed away, and you may be sad, but don't forget my relatives pass away all the time. We pray for Paris, we pray for Beirut, we pray for Israel, we pray for Mali, but we don't compare the tragedies or, pray or play suffering one-upmanship. In moments of tragedy, we let each connection of pain radiate for itself. Each bullet, each loss, each stabbing, each moment. This is the first step we keep in mind in moments of pain, as we make sure that we acknowledge that pain. We reflect on it for its own sake. Each tragedy is a tragedy. We are a people well acquainted with suffering and the Valley of Shadows. I attended Professor Maris's lecture this past Holocaust Education Week. The theme this year, if I can paraphrase, was when the Holocaust was over, many people think it was sunshine and happiness as people began their new lives, but in France, in displaced persons camp, as people returned to their hometowns in Paris, the suffering continued. This is a theme that also appears in this week's parasha. The Midrash says that our matriarch Leah was to have been Esau's wife. But when word of what kind of person he was came to her, she wept so much that when the biblical text describes her and her sister, it points out that her sister is beautiful of form and of face. And Leah, she has weak eyes. And then... When Jacob wakes up after the wedding feast and finds Leah in his bed, Jacob shouts out, Mazot asitali, what have you done to me? Just what every girl wants to hear from her husband, <laughs> right in front of her father, just as the husband has finished consummating the marriage. To show her mental state, 
She tries to earn her husband's love, but the text is clear as to how that goes. Listen to the names of her first three sons. Reuven, the eternal Ra'ah, saw my plight. And yes, now my husband will love me, the text says. And then Shimon, the eternal Shama, heard that I am despised and has given me this one too. And then Levi. And now this time, my husband will be attached to me. Yulaveh, for I've born to him three sons. This time he'll be attached to me. Three sons, through each one she suffered, yet Leah continued on. She moved from a place of despair over her relationship with her husband into a place of love for her sons. She was pregnant again and then had a fourth son. This time I give thanks, Odeh et Adonai. I give thanks to the Eternal and names her son Judah. She moves from suffering, each son marking the terrible state of relationship with the man that she lets impregnate her over and over again to a place of thanks. Rabbi Shai Held teaches, Strikingly, the name Leah gives her fourth son Judah, meaning I will praise or I will express gratitude, becomes the name of the Jewish people as a whole. Jew, Yehudi, comes from the name Judah, Yehuda. Who is a Jew? One who discovers the possibility of gratitude even amidst heartbreak. That is why we are given the name that expresses Leah's courage and her achievement. A Jew is ideally a human being who, like Leah, can find her way to gratitude without having everything she wants or needs. Rabbi Held continues, Disappointment need not preclude gratitude, nor need gratitude crowd out the very real possibility of disappointment. Judaism does not ask us to choose one feeling or another, but rather makes, peace, makes space, indeed, seeks to teach us to make space for the sheer complexity and contradictoriness of human experience. Who better than Leah to teach us that a broken heart can also have moments of profound fullness? The rabbis mentioned in another midrash, they say that Leah is the first to praise God. What does this mean, some ask? Because there are others in the text previously who praise God as well. The rabbis respond that Leah, though, praised God even after suffering. Now, I will make what I admit is a slight jump or a slight different reading here. Though we do praise God in moments of tragedy, upon hearing of a death, it is traditional to say, Baruch Dayan Ha'amet, praise is the true judge. And the Kaddish prayer itself is an expression of this ethos. I'm going to read praise God in another way, which is to keep hope alive. And thus we find our second half of our response. First, acknowledging the tragedy and giving it space before we interpret and spin it. And the second imperative, to thank God, or turning thanks into action to retain our hope in God. Hope in those created in God's image. Hope in our world. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in his recent book, Future Tense, talks about the role of being a Yehudi, a Jew, and of keeping hope alive. Now, for our scholarly friends here, I feel I need to point out that Rabbi Sachs is giving a very romantic view of Jews in history, but we're in shul, so we'll suspend our critical thoughts for poetry at the moment. Rabbi Sachs teaches... It is no accident that in the modern world, many Jews became economists fighting poverty or doctors combating disease or lawyers contesting injustice or teachers battling ignorance or psychotherapists striving to defeat despair. The great Jewish thinkers, even those who had abandoned Judaism, were almost invariably utopians or revolutionaries, charting secular routes to hope. Jews never accept the, accepted that war violence, injustice, exploitation, the corruption of power, and the seductions of success are written into the structure of the universe. They do not believe that tragedy is inevitable, that human aspiration is hubris to be punished by nemesis, that a blind fate governs all things, that the universe or the gods are at best indifferent, at worst actively hostile to humankind. They do not believe that genetic determinism means that all our efforts to change are fruitless and unworthwhile. 
if God defines himself as I will be what I will be, then he is telling us that, created in his, his image, we too can be what we will be. To be a Jew is to be an agent of hope. Every ritual, every command, every syllable of the Jewish story is a protest against escapism, resignation, and the blind acceptance of fate. Judaism, the religion of the free God, is a re religion of freedom. Jewish faith is written in the future tense. It is belief in a future that is not yet but could be if we heeded God's call, obey God's will, and act together as a covenantal community. The name of the Jewish future is hope. He continues, Somehow, in a way, I find mysterious and moving that Jewish people wrote a story of hope that has the power to inspire all who dare to believe that injustice and brutality are not the final word about the human condition, that faith can be more powerful than empires, that love given is not given in vain, that ideals are not illusions to give us comfort, but candles to light our way along a winding road in the dark night without giving way to fear or losing a sense of direction. He includes his book. And the Jewish task remains. To be the voice of hope in an age of fear, the counter voice in the conversation of humankind. To be the voice of hope in an age of fear. To conclude, we let the tragedy resonate, we mourn, we ask why. We do our best to make sure it never happens again. That our loved ones in Israel, in Paris, in all countries are safe. Yet we also have a religious calling as Jews. We also have a religious calling to balance our mourning with praise of God's name. In the face of fear of the other, we stand forward and say, that all are created in the image of God. In the face of fear of the other, we step forward and say that all deserve to be treated as human beings, that all need safety, that we are all children of Abraham, that we, are, we as Jews are children of our once bitter matriarch Leah. And in spite of this or because of this, we are the, are the counter voice that cries out in a time of fear to trust. We are the counter voice that cries out in a time of fear that we must have hope. Shabbat Shalom.